Hi guys, it is a spectacularly gorgeous day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here today in mid-February 2019 here in Florida, but we are going to go all the way across the pond over to Italy where I have the absolute honor and good fortune to be speaking with uh, one of my one of my heroes here in the collapse rabbit hole, Ugo Bardi, and anybody down here in the in the collapse of fear should know who Ugo is. But if you don't, I'm going to give you a brief introduction before we start. Professor Ugo Bardi is professor in physical chemistry at the University of Florence. He is the author of a number of books and articles on the subject of mineral resources and their depletion. And, and some of his books are extracted about, which is obviously about mineral depletion and the limits to growth revisited, which we're going to be talking a lot, a lot about. Uh, he's real involved in the peak oil uh, discussion. Ugo's work focuses on promoting a sustainable transition to renewable energy on the basis of quantitative energy yield analyses. In his blog, Cassandra's Legacy, he examines, among other things, the Seneca effect, which you may know as the Seneca cliff or the Seneca collapse a biophysical interpretation of the collapse of complex systems. And I just want to touch briefly over here at Cassandra's Legacy. Anybody down here not being familiar with Cassandra's Legacy, which is Ugo's blog, the subtitle of that is Always Plan for the Worst Case Hypothesis. And Ugo says about Cassandra's Legacy, this blog deals with the future of humankind in view of such things as the over-exploitation of natural resources and the effects of global warming. It is a bit catastrophic, I know, but after all, the ancient prophetess Cassandra turned out to have been right. So it sounds like we're going to have a lot of fun today. So Ugo Barty, come on and say hello to the folks, and then we're just going to dive into this free-ranging conversation. <laughs> hello, everybody. A very nice introduction. Thank you, Sam. Okay, off, off we go. So, so Ugo, I, I admit uh, I've been thinking of calling you for, for... It's been way too long for me putting off calling you. It's like... Every time now, every single day, uh, I am opening, even on the mainstream media now, and seeing mm -hmm. all of these faster than previously thought. The situation is worse than we previously thought, and the catastrophe seems to be unrolling much faster than previously thought. And this obviously, I think, of the Seneca collapse or the Seneca cliff or the Seneca effect. So I want you in a few minutes to explain your Seneca collapse hypothesis and tell the people, are we in fact reading in the mainstream media that we are at the edge of the Seneca cliff of collapse on this planet today? All right, Sam. You see, sometimes I'm afraid uh of my own creature. I sort of gave a name to this phenomenon that I call the Seneca effect from the ancient Roman philosopher Seneca, who, you know, are these things which are obvious when you think about um, them, like, like the fact that things tend to fall, to collapse, to crash, to disappear, to fade, to flounder, um, to go bad faster, much faster than the time it takes to build things. Things of a house of cards, it takes a lot of time to build up a house of cards on your desk, but then just you just knees and the whole thing goes down. And, you know, what I did, uh, now it makes eight years ago, eight years ago I made a model, a mathematical model, say, so, okay, look, 
it, there is a certain logic in things going in this way. It has to do with the way the universe works, its entropy eventually, which plays its role in the universe. We all know more or less, more or less what entropy is. Things tend to go bad, tend to go disordered, tend to spread over and lose focus. That's entropy. But there is also another principle which is not yet enshrined in the three laws of thermodynamics, is that things tend to go wrong fast. So the Seneca effect is nothing like nothing more than an idea which is moving into in within the thermodynamics, the experts in thermodynamics or known um, irreversible systems who so say things are not just going to uh, the highest possible entropy, they are going there fast. And that's what we call collapse. And so in this view, there is a certain logic that what we see now is that faster than previously expected, because I know, I understand that most people don't think of entropy every day. That's especially our leaders, our politicians, our, our um, opinion leaders. And so there is this surprise that now it seems that all around us things are really going bad, fast, faster than expected. We don't have time. Also, is something that you may have heard. We don't have time to act. We have waited for too long. So it's pretty possible that something real wrong could happen, and, and that would be the Seneca cliff. But, you know, the future is always difficult to predict, and it is also possible to be over-pessimistic. It's So I... I I am afraid sometimes on my own creation to try to maintain a certain mental. Oops, we're low. But we may, after all, okay, we may you, still you have time. Fade, you, you just faded out for about 15 seconds. So try to fill in that, that last 15 seconds that uh, you were talking about not becoming too too pessimistic, but but... Are, are you, you know, I always ask this question, do you consider yourself an optimist, a pessimist, or just a realist? And how pessimistic are you? Uh, right. You see, there are, uh, there are several stage of pe stages of pessimism. <laughs> and I think, I think recently I came with another idea, which, which is now coming up, that we will not be able to avoid collapse, some form of collapse, because really we waited for too long. The system has been, has been unbalanced. The uh, several enormous forces are in motion, and it is extremely will be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to stop the change which is already ongoing. And this, if the system has passed the famous and dreaded tipping point, we would not be able to avoid that. So we have a collapse, but there is life after collapse. So, That's so, the point. so you're saying we are already over uh, over the edge of Niagara Falls in our little barrel, and uh, and and we and we we're not going to turn the barrel around and and head back upstream at this point. It is not possible anymore to go back completely. We can try to slow down the descent. We can try to mitigate the um, climate change trajectory. We can try to do what we can to avoid the resource depletion. But we are in overshoot. It's a fundamental concept. As overshoot was developed by, by the people who wrote the Limits to Growth, you mentioned this book that uh, I wrote a few years ago, The Limits to Growth Revisited. And the point that you learn when you go back to that book is that they had already everything clear. Overshoot first, and even the Seneca collapse. If you look well, define, at the curves that they prepared, over... the, the model, yeah. they, they are Seneca curves. They grow slow and they collapse fast. So if, um, last year I went to, I, I was discussing with one of the authors of the original study, the 1972 study, The Limits to Growth, 
with Jorgen Randers, and they said, did you notice, Jorgen, that you already had the Seneca curves in your model? And he looked at me and said, really? <laughs> we hadn't noticed that. <laughs> but it is the same thing. It's part of the, of the mechanism. The universe works in that way. Things grow slowly and then go down fast. The whole point now, how fast? And what is after, afterward? Okay, and so that's the concept. Uh, uh. This is the concept, let me tell you the last thing, the, the concept of Seneca bottleneck. Okay. We go through the bottleneck and we re-emerge on the other side of the cliff. And how we re-emerge, if we re-emerge, depends on what we are doing and what we will be doing now and in the coming years. Well, the, the, the question is, are we going to re we're not we're not going to reemerge into a five degree C hotter world. There will be no reemergence from it'll be a one way bottleneck is is a lot of it dependent on where we can literally hold the the wet bulb temperature, as they call it on the planet. <laughs> We can hold the temperature. The planet is has a very high resilience. It is very slow in changing, so there is still a chance to slow down and to avoid the wars. But even if we go down or up, if you prefer, to five, six degrees of heating, that doesn't mean that we cannot reemerge. But uh, we have to move way north or way south. It means that our descendants will be living in Antarctica, maybe. Uh, but there is life after five degrees because the planet has already been over five, six degrees of temperature in the past and the ecosystem survived that. Yeah. It, is not, it is not necessarily the end of the ecosystem. It is not necessarily the extinction of the human species. It is a, a heavy test now, that by all means. Uh, okay, so I, 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 I'm just letting you know I, I can already hear some of the comments from the doomers uh, to, to, to that assertion that, that humanity, because, you know, a lot of people, I, I just want to, obviously, Ugo, you are not uh, of the camp that humans are going to be extinct by the year 2026. You are, you are not in that camp. I think it's safe to say. No, no, <laughs> no, emphatically no. That's an idiocy. It doesn't work that way. We, especially is a, is a moral failure to start saying that. Maybe it will happen. I mean, it's like, uh, like uh, you, me, a single human being, so we may die tomorrow. How do we know? It could happen. But we cannot sit down and say there is nothing we can do since we are sure we are going to die tomorrow. No, that's a failure of moral, lack of moral fiber. We have to fight. If there is a chance to survive, we fight to survive. Okay, so I, I, I just wanted to clear that for the record. But well, Okay, let, let's divide it up this way, as, as I call it, the the increasing depth of the doomsday prophecy pool, because you address... You address, and this channel addresses, uh, three, three depths of collapse. And one, I want you to speak briefly as, as, not, as a non-American. I don't want to spend too much time on this. I notice your newest Cassandra's Legacy is talking about this. Is number one, the collapse of the American Empire. The United States yeah. Empire. Let's speak for a few minutes. Then we've got global industrial civilization in the middle. And then, of course, the biggest one of all is, is the ecological collapse. This is a lot to put into uh, the, the, the next uh, 30 minutes. So let's give, uh, let, let's give the American Empire... Let's give it six or seven, six or seven minutes ago. What is your prognosis, particularly in the in the age of Donald Trump? How long is the American oh, Empire have left, brother? Before we're we're toast. No, it's okay. It's so fascinating. You see, you look at the Roman history because that's a prototypical empire, the, the first great empire, so similar to our empire, and we are following exactly the same path in terms of the American empire. And so the American, the, the Roman empire was based on mineral resources, which was gold, 
extracted from the Spanish mines of the empire, so the gold made it possible for the Romans to be a military empire. They were conquerors, they were um, dominators, so they were dominating the Mediterranean, Europe, Northern Europe, perhaps Northern Africa, and so And, uh, of course, when they ran out of gold, and then they said, well, uh, uh, when they had no hope to continue, and they disappeared, although they tried their best to keep to keep going. And that's exactly what's happening now to the American empire. The American empire is based on mineral resources. These mineral resources are gradually fading, not because we are running out of anything, but because it is becoming more and more expensive. So the empire needs to spend more and more money in mineral resources, which then are used to build up a bigger and bigger and bigger military apparatus, which is so expensive to become neg a negative value for the empire, it's spending so much money for the military system that uh, that they will never be able to keep going for a long, long time. So so that's what, where we're going. Let's say that the, Rome, the, the Roman Empire, fortunately, didn't have nuclear weapons, although the American Empire does. So the risk is now that uh, that they should really are catastrophistic, that somebody may want to use nuclear weapons, and now we are not in a condition to be able to re-emerge out of a nuclear holocaust without being in real, real bad shape. That I, I don't know how civilization could survive that, but again, um, it is not necessarily that uh, that uh, we have a nuclear war, so we may not have it, and the empire may simply fade away, just as it happened to, to the previous empire, which was the Soviet empire. It disappeared without doing too much damage. So with a little bit of luck, we can think that the American empire will do exactly the same. So how many years do you do how many years do you give it before nobody can deny the American empire is now finished? Are we talking five it's, years? Um, years yeah, there is years? about a factor of 10 in comparison to the Roman empire. The Roman empire took um, 2 300 years to disappear from from the maximum level it reached. 300 years for the Roman Empire is a factor of 10 faster for the American Empire, so 30 years or so. 30 Something years. Something like that. Uh, okay, well, see, and, and before I move on to the middle of the, I, I just want to quickly get your answer. I have been hearing for years, and, uh, and Chris Hedges had a big article about it last week, about this whole talk about the American dollar, the petrodollar, whatever, no longer being the world reserve currency, that when the, the, the American dollar is no longer the reserve currency, that is going to be the final blow. What is your opinion on that, on that question of well, the, the reserve currency? That's obvious. That's the way things work. The Roman Empire was based on currency. The currency was called, um, there were several kinds of currency, the Oros, the, um, the Sesterces, uh, the, but it was metal money. But it is, doesn't matter if uh, the currency is in metal as it used to be or in paper as it is now. Currency is worth nothing if it cannot be converted to yeah. something, something real. So the Romans could convert their currency to items that they would typically import from China. They didn't. They were not manufacturing a manufacturing civilization. They imported luxury items from China, and that was the mechanism. The American Empire exists. The dollar is based on the dollar, and it exists because the dollar can be converted into crude oil. If it is, cannot be done anymore, the dollar is useless. And so there goes the empire. That's so simple. So you agree with that. Do you, how many years out are we on? Are we, again, are we talking five years before the rest of the planet says we're going on without you? Or are you, are you, are you well, I, saying 30? I think uh, Mr. Trump, the idea of Mr. Trump, and not just of Mr. Trump, or if you like to call him Emperor Trump, which I think will become fashionable soon, Emperor Trump wants to limit the reach 
of the empire, abandoning um, most of the world to China, to Russia, to areas that the empire cannot control anymore. And uh, in a more limited area, the dollar, now reduced to a local currency, can still be converted yeah. into oil and uh, a reduced sized empire could last a few decades more. Okay. Yeah, that's what just just so you guys, if you go on Cassandra's legacy, that a great picture of Emperor Trump, and he talks yeah. about this more. As much as I would love to keep on with the American Empire, I know there at least the rest of the planet could care less. So let's move into uh, the 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 next level of depth of the pool here: global industrial civilization. <laughs> Uh, not, not, not looking at the ecosystems, but the actual social structure, the glue that is keeping this whole planet uh, going along, in a, you, know, go, you know, the global industrial civilization as we've come to know it, uh, how, many, how many years before we unquestionably hit the limits to growth and can no longer keep having infinite growth on a finite planet. How many years and what's it going to look like when we hit the wall? Well, that's a good question. Now, what you see when you use models, models, dynamic models for the systems or the industrial system, you see that the system works as long as you can feed it with energy. You have a flow of energy into the system, and the system grows in complexity. It becomes what we know and what we call the industrial civilization, a civilization in which you can buy things, get things um, from transportation, heating your home, having clothes for, for against the cold, um, food or whatever you 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 need to buy. And this system works because it processes mainly energy. Energy, in this case, Dow, is, is, has a cost. And so the point is that if you want to flow the system, to, to supply the system with energy, you need to spend energy. There are simple models which can explain this. And the point is that you have that uh, the efficiency of the system is going down. And if the efficiency of the system goes down, it becomes difficult for the system to continue to produce items that create the complexity of the system. And if you run the model, you see that uh, in all condition, the, it is this uh, reduced efficiency of the system, the fact that the energy is grinding down to a more difficult time to get the energy it needs, it will eventually collapse. There is little that can be done about that because we are using something like 85% of this energy comes from fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, how long can they last in terms of the efficiency that we have now? Maybe 10, 20, 30 years, maybe less than that because collapse is something that it is triggered. Maybe we can still have a, a few decades if we were very careful, but if we are not, a big financial collapse will make it impossible to exploit fossil fuels, even though they could be still exploited for a while. So the problem is a problem of organization, of, of, of system, of how the, the various elements of the system interact with each other in such a way to be able to keep going up to a certain point. In any case, my point is that uh, we will be better off if we try, starting now, to build a substitute energy source to fossil fuels, because fossil fuels are not 100%, they are 85%. So we have 15%, which is not fossil, which is mainly renewable, in part, nuclear. Unfortunately, 15%, if you lose 85%, you're left with 15%. That's very bad, very difficult to keep together an um, um, industrial civilization with just 15% of what you have. It's impossible. But if you think of a country like Norway, Norway uses 59% renewable energy and just 41% fossils. And then if you could arrive to that, there is nothing that you cannot 
do with 60%. If you had to, if you had to renounce to 100% and use only 60%, you can do that. But you cannot, you cannot save the industrial civilization on 15%. So if we want to avoid, no, we cannot avoid it. If we can to mitigate the Seneca bottleneck, we need to invest now as long as we can into renewable energy, which will help us a lot to avoid the suffering that we are going to suffer because there is little way to avoid what we are going to see in the, in the coming years. If we, if, if we did miraculously today go over to re renewable energy, right? To, to tomorrow morning we wake up, there's no more fossil fuels on the planet, that some people would say the, the worst thing in the world we could do is give humanity an unlimited supply of, of clean, renewable energy, that all it would do is it would just put us on steroids to ramp up everything else we're doing wrong and bring on societal and ecological collapse even faster than we're doing it with fossil fuels. What is your response to that? Which I think is a valid question. It's a perfectly valid question. The point is that uh, renewable energy has some built-in limits that fossil fuels don't have. So you cannot um, cover the whole planet with solar panels because then you, you, you have no place left for <laughs> To cultivate food, so that's that's a limit. I think I think people won't be so stupid to do to do that, but um, it, it's eventually a question of control, control of the system. The system is complex. It doesn't need really have intelligent control in the sense that it has a brain, but the system must built in feedbacks, feedbacks stabilize the system and uh, there is this big problem that uh, fossil fuels don't have don't really have stabilizing um, feedbacks except depletion depletion acts as a delayed stabilizing feedback when it starts to kick in then it is too late because you're already in overshoot and you are falling down the Seneca cliff, and then uh, the system controls. The system is telling you you have to stop, but it tells you that late, very late, you suffer. A system like uh, in based on renewable energy start telling you, okay, you're building these panels, but be careful because you're covering too much land. So stop doing that, and everything will stop there. You don't have to collapse, but you have to slow down. So. Renewable energy as a feedback system, which is not so adventurous, roller coaster style as a fossil fuels. So that's, um, you see the point. So it is a different kind of system with different kind of built in controls, and it is possible to stabilize it. We haven't ever done this, but we know that uh, agricultural civilization, which are also civilizations based on solar light, that succeeded in controlling and stabilizing the system. It is possible to stabilize a system based on renewable energy because it has already been done with agriculture. Uh, uh, okay, again, I would, I would like to, as I can easily pursue this line of questioning for, uh, for, for the second half of this interview, but there's so, I'm, I'm trying to put a 30-year career in, into uh, into less than an hour here, Ugo. So I need to move on a little bit. I want you to talk briefly about, I mean, briefly about the limits to growth. Now, I believe way back, you know, going on 50 years now, they were talking about, yeah. I think their model came out most likely that we were going to be in serious deep kimchi around 2050. And then you wrote your sure. own book, Revisited. Are, are, are you still seeing 2050 as a rough yardstick when it's really going to be obvious that things are not the same on this planet? Well, it's, uh, you see, the limits to grow was, was such a big thing, such a, so advanced, so incredibly advanced, so innovative. It was fantastic, and as you would expect, it was not understood. 
at the time. And still, it is very difficult to understand it for most people. But it was a fantastic advance of thought. There was some concept which did not exist before. Think about the concept of overshoot. Overshoot is obvious for us. Not for everybody. Let's say for some people who are concerned about the environment, are concerned about growth, are concerned about our long-term survival, then the concept of overshoot is fundamental. But it didn't exist before 1970. Yeah. It was an innovation. Was that wow? Wow, that's a guy. Why, why, why that? If you ask to an economist, economics as a science it doesn't have overshoot. It doesn't exist into inside economics as a science. So they cannot understand some phenomena which nevertheless happen. In economics, there is nothing like a Seneca cliff. Because the Seneca cliff, the economics is always assuming that we go slowly into a near equilibrium um, condition. So if you cannot climb a mountain, you will never fall down from a mountain. <laughs> so you see the difference. And, and in economics, you never climb. You are always on, on a flat, on the plains. And that's the difference between, between economics and system dynamics. So this is the great innovation of of the limits to growth. So we're is, in overshoot now, and, and, and clearly an overshoot now in, in 2019, and we have been for, th that can be debated how many years, but how many more years can the can global industrial uh, civilization and to a larger extent the planet put up with this crap? Before it before can go like this, not very long. I think there are some evidence signs that we are we are going to some kind of financial crisis or war, either one or both, maybe even both. But if the system were to be um, left alone and not disturbed too much, it could still go on for a decade or two. Actually, anyway, the main the basic elements of the scenarios produced by the limits to growth in 1972 said that we could collapse around the first two, three decades of the 21st century. So that's that's a possibility. I think I think it's even likely because the system cannot keep going. It is very clear if you live in Italy, as I do, you see we are collapsing. We deny that. We don't want to say this to anybody, but it, it, it is politically incorrect to say Italy is collapsing. But if you live here, you realize that you are. We are collapsing. The United States is not collapsing right now because you found this good uh, this, this trick to start extracting tight oil or shale oil, which is giving to the system new life for a while. So I think the, the whole system is pivoting around the United States. As long as the United States can keep extracting shale oil, the system has a precarious balance. It stands more or less, it works like a zombie, but it works. And uh, the point is that uh, shale oil is extremely expensive. It is, it is not providing a profit. It is mainly a financial bubble, which nevertheless, not just a financial bubble because it does produce energy. But it's, it's an unstable form of energy. At some moment, the system may find uh, that shale oil is too expensive. And when shale oil collapses, the whole world collapses. That's the interesting point. Everything right now is set on this single point, which is shale oil and shale gas. And that, that is the one, the, the, the one thing pretty much propping up the American empire. And, and Emperor Trump is doing everything he can to put all his eggs in that one basket, as far as I can tell. Is that, the, is that your reading? I think so, yeah. It's uh, Mr. Trump, or Emperor Trump, if you prefer. He, I, I think he has this big advantage of being a person who is not very sophisticated. I think no one is not an offense. And he, he, what he perceives, he acts upon. So he acts immediately on his perception. And he perceives very well this question that energy is fundamental, shale oil is fundamental. Even, I think, as the idea that coal could, within limits, replace 
shale oil in terms of producing energy for the for the system and so that that as long as this can be done the system can keep going but not forever well maybe till the end of his, his term in office which will please don't tell mm. me six more years I, I can't even go there so anyway, again, just, just to move forward, as I say, I would love to continue down to any one of these the, these side trips. But I always, uh, of course, what I interviewing my guests from all over the spectrum on this subject. What in Europe? So what is this going to look like? Are you a member of the the Mad Max? I mean, when when. The, the shale oil collapses, the American dollar is no longer the world reserve currency, the, the, uh, we've hit the limits to growth. Are you the, 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 one of the Mad Max viewers? Or the uh, what do you the mean? Landers? Mad Max, uh, the film, uh, has people still desperately clinging, clinging to um, oil, still using oil, but... Uh, if you if you think so, I am not a Mad Max man. I, I think we should replace oil with something else. And and it's uh, it, if we still if we have a few more years, I think we could soften the the problem. But not going to a Mad Max, a completely Mad Max situation. Some countries, however, will will get exactly that. Uh, but. It could be possible to avoid what, what, what the political it, what, collapse. It, what, what does it look like for for people in in uh, we, we won't even we won't even look at sub-Saharan Africa. We can already see where that's going. But let's look at at, at just the the person listening to this. What is it going to look like, possibly for them, depending on how old they are, and certainly for their children and and God forbid their grandchildren. What is you know an average American or an average European uh, li living this le at least an Italian level of lifestyle? What is life going to look like uh, 20, 30 years from now? I mean, just day to day living. What's it going to look like? Uh, that's a good, that's a good question. It's very difficult to see because when things collapse, then it becomes all prediction be becomes impossible. Yeah. You don't know how the system will react. Uh, so you see, the only thing I, I I I trust, I rely upon, is the Roman Empire, which I think is a good model for the present empire. So let's go back a little uh, to the Roman Empire. So what happened when the Romans collapse? they maintained the former political structure as long as they could, becoming more and more poor. And eventually, when the system disappeared, the centralized appear disappeared, they went back to the forms of government and of society which existed before the empire. So I think that's exactly what will happen to us. And we are seeing it because you see, in Europe, there is this big movement for national sovereignty, which is what happened before the American and European empire. We had national states, which then coalesced into what we could call a European empire here, which was a subset of the American empire. Now, the American empire disappears. We go back to national states for a while. And then even national states could be unsustainable economically because we don't have sufficient energy to keep the machine yeah. Yeah. running. And so we have to go back to what we had before, which was kingdoms. And um, we go back to feudal states. And that's, uh, that's, I think, where we're going. We're going to a fragmentation, a big fragmentation of the political system, which is not anymore able to control very large state um, apparatuses like the European Union, for instance. That's going to disappear very soon. Give to the European Union, how many years would you give to them? Um, five years, maybe, uh, or 10 years? Mm. If, okay, they can disappear any moment. So you're looking because, at a, certainly a yeah. much more localized, uh, shattered, localized uh, e economy of kingdoms and fiefdoms. Is it? 
Is is it going to be violent warlords and stuff, or is it is it going to be hippies out there in their organic gardens? My and well, not that I like the idea of living in a medieval situation. I don't know how how happy people were at that time, but I think it was very hard life. I mean, it's not something that any way we can decide. If we cannot afford an empire, we cannot have it. And if we cannot afford a state, we cannot have it. We have to go back to a, a castle and a village. <laughs> and um, that could be. Depends how much energy we are able to supply to the system. If we supply energy to the system, the system will grow and will develop what we call a civilization. Uh, okay. Zero energy, we have no civilization. Now, obviously, it, it, it seems to me, again, I don't want to, I'm certainly not want to put words in, in your mouth, but obviously what you just described is not going to be a planet of even 7.6 billion people, much less the 10 or 12 billion, whatever the UN is calling for by the end of the year. Where is the, in, in, a, in a lifestyle like that, what are we looking at in terms of a global population and under that scenario? Well, I think that um, when the empire, the Roman Empire collapsed, the European population was at the beginning, it was, uh, I think, I'm citing from memory, but could be a few hundred million, a hundred million people, you know, the Roman Empire, maybe 200 million, the whole Roman Empire. So it went down, well, down really to Europe, what maybe a few tens of millions of people, can you believe that? So unfortunately, if we have a political collapse, we cannot sustain the population at the present level. So many people are worried about population. They say population growth is a problem. No, I don't think that's the problem. The problem is decline. Because I broke up. Just repeat works. what you just said. Did you say that you don't think population growth is the problem? Is the it's going to be a massive population decline? Talk about the Seneca Cliff. I mean, I I see the population collapsing from let's call it eight billion to whatever in, in a matter of less than a decade. Do you agree with that or? Or, yeah, that's it. Uh, I think we are going to see a population collapse because we already seen it in, uh, in similar situation. It's not that I am pessimistic or that I re let me repeat. It's not something that I I I like the idea. I hate this idea of seeing people dying. But and for this reason, I propose to build up as much renewable energy infrastructure as possible because this will help reduce the population decline and possibly stabilize it to a level which is sustainable because it what is still the question of the Seneca bottleneck. Yeah. What it depends how down we go. If we go to the bottom, then we do not re-emerge anymore. Yeah. Uh, 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 okay, so let's finish out uh, with that. So we're, good Lord. so we're 45 minutes into this, so let's get into what I call the, the deep end of the doomsday prophecy pool. And the, the, the big difference between the collapse of every other empire in history and this one is the, the ecological environmental collapse overshadowing uh, and encompassing all of these, quote, which smaller wheels within the big wheel. The Romans and everyone else did not were not facing the sixth mass extinction. They were not facing the plastic crisis. They were not facing the the climate change going into however many degrees. They weren't facing the blue ocean event. We we this is the first time we have ever been here, and the whole planet is here. And my question to you is, is the, the, the big kahuna, which is the ecological collapse, which is most of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the worse than we previously thought, faster than previously thought. What is your, what, what is your view of, of all of that big wheel that, that holds? It is, are all of these smaller wheels going to be able to have any chance when the big boy goes?
I hope you're still there. Oh no, we seem to have lost uh Ugo, are you still there? Please tell me we're going to get you back. Okay, well guys, we're going to uh, try to get Ugo back and finish this up in the uh, in, in, in part two. So let me... Uh... Okay, okay are you back? now I hear you. Do you hear? Okay, are we are we back? So did you did you hear my did you hear my question about uh, the the? I question I heard. Okay, so then something, so, something went wrong. A collapse hit us. As you, yes, as you so uh, we're talking. The, you oh, see, collapses do exist. Uh, yes, we're do talking the now? overarching, the overarching ecological of the eco ecosystem, which yeah. will know it will happen at some moment in the future. We think it will not happen before several hundred million years from now. But if the ecosystem can die, if it could die now for what we can say, like me and you, we are not supposed to die tomorrow, but we could because we are mortal, we, we can die. So, but that's the worst case hypothesis. And I don't think it is even very interesting because if, the, if it happens, we won't be there to see it. So there are, there are possibilities. So to, what what is your least, vision? What what is the likelihood that I don't know what, what, what is, is likely? Happening I cannot say what is likely. I can say one thing is that we can fight to make some bad hypothesis less likely, and that's what we should do. Okay, well, let's talk. Let, it, it, it doesn't seem like you you you, you want to pursue the, uh, the the deepest end of the doomsday prophecy pool, which is total ecological collapse, where you know where every species except jellyfish are gone, including humans. Yeah. If, yeah. if that's going to happen, you just say it's going to happen, and then, and at that point, oh well, end of discussion. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Some people say that's our destiny. It could be. I mean, I, I'm open to consider this as a possibility. But as I said, it is not very interesting. And surely <laughs> it is not an excuse to sit down and do nothing. Okay, so what I so say let's, is that... Let's finish yes? out the last few minutes. What, uh, what obviously, the, 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 the final question always in my interviews is... What can we do both as a, a global industrial society to turn this around and and uh, as an, as individuals is there at this point is there anything in our individual lifestyle and consumer choices that any one of us can do to make a difference in your opinion from this point forward? I think we are all stakeholders in making this not happening so what do we have to do? It's known, you, you know it, everybody knows it. we have to get rid, stop using fossil fuels. First, that's basic. If we keep using fossil fuels, we have no hope. Eventually, we are going to go through this bottleneck and quite possibly die as a civilization first, and maybe even as a species as well. So this is a moral obligation we have toward, toward ourselves and also toward the ecosystem to stop using fossil fuels as soon as it is humanly possible. We cannot do that tomorrow morning because we all die if we stop using fossil fuels. <laughs> but we can do this in, in a, on a scale of uh, two or three decades by making a serious effort. And that means not just in stopping using fossil fuels, because it doesn't matter if we just stop using fossil fuels, we do it tomorrow, we do it in 10 years, we do it in 30 years, we all die. We need to replace them. Replace <coughs> doesn't mean to do exactly the same things that we do with fossil fuels, means using, means giving to the complex system that we call civilization. It needs energy in order to exist. And if we want to have a civilization, we need to provide energy to the system to make, to keep civilization alive, which I think is what we should do. Some people say we go back to Stone Age, and this is a very good thing. It's, a, it's also a choice. Right? I, I, it's possible to maintain that that's the good thing to do, but, but I don't agree. And, and so we need to invest into an infrastructure which is based on renewable energy. 
And that's but you, what is the evidence you see? Kind of, you know, I mean, the, during the middle of that last dog and pony show, uh, they that, that the last climate talks over there in Poland was in the middle of that. They announced for the first time in human history that we're sucking on 100 million barrels per day of fossil fuels out of the ground. <laughs> yeah, that's and right. And carbon that's emissions right. are higher than they've ever been in 2018. And there's no yes. evidence they're going to go down. Yes. It's, Do you see it's any the maximum, evidence? The historical that, maximum is going to go down. There is no way to avoid that. And, that's, uh, and we are lucky that there is no way to avoid that because people, if they could keep increasing over 100 million barrels per day, per day, they would do it. And that would be a suicide for civilization. So if we have a chance to avoid committing suicide, we have to go down and but go down as fast as possible. Do you see any evidence that we're doing that, especially with, the, with this? No, we're not, doing, and... we're not doing it consciously. And we, cannot, I, I, we have no control mechanism which will lead us to do this. But we see, when you study this system, these systems have control mechanisms. Control mechanisms are built in the system. And the only control system which is built in the fossil fuel system is depletion. It is the only damping reducing feedback and it is going to kick in there's nothing that can be done to avoid it it is going to cause production to crash it is going to happen it's not avoidable and it is a control system and there is no other control system we cannot just take hundreds of people hundreds of politicians in paris and say we are going to reduce the 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 consumption the production of fossil fuels it that won't work that's not a control system it is not embedded in the system the system is complex it uses its own powerful immensely powerful control system which are and this control system is called depletion and depletion will destroy the fossil fuel industry but is it going to uh, happen in, in, in time to ma make a difference to yeah. the outcome of global industrial be. civilization or the, or the biosphere? We are going to see that. It, it's, a, it's an interesting race. We we'll see. <laughs> are, are, you call, are you calling a winner in the photo finish, Ugo Bardi? Uh, <laughs> who, who's going to be the winner of the photo finish in this one? We have a sort of photo finish. Either we live or we die. But it's normal in life, right? Either you die or you live. Okay, so as I... Well, well Ugo Barty, I really appreciate this, but we're going to have a collapse of global industrial civilization in less than five minutes. So how I... I, I want you to stick around after we hang up, but I always ask my guests to close... With this, if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, but actually had the mainstream media uh, sticking a microphone in your face and saying, Ugo Barty, you have 60 seconds to send your message out to planet Earth, what would that 60 second mainstream media sound bite sound like from, from uh, Ugo Barty as we head into the next phase of human civilization? You see, our ancestors were farmers, mainly farmers, and they survived bad times, they survived droughts, they survived floods, they survived famines, because we are here. It means that our ancestors survived. How did they do that? Because they planned for the future, and they saved some seed for the next harvest. And I think this is the key point of survival. We must save some of our resources for the future, a seed for a new harvest for our descendants. There you go. That was, that was, that was very poetic, mm. and, and I hope it was <laughs> poetic and prophetic. We, we, will, uh, we will see. But anyway, folks, again, if you are not familiar with, uh, with Ugo's blog, Cassandra's Legacy. I'll put the link on to here where you can just dive into the this man's mind. Uh, he has a lot of excellent essays over on resilience.org. 
uh, several books, uh, and, I'm, and I'm thinking I didn't have time to get to it. Hopefully, some new books coming out in the near future. And when when your new book comes out, we'll we'll have another discussion. But right now, we have to wrap this up. So uh, again, stick around for just a minute after we say bye. But but Ugo Barty, we really really appreciate you taking this time out of your busy schedule to talk to us and keep up the good fight. Okay, thank you very much, Sam. It was a pleasure. All right, guys, uh, hang in there, and we will see you next week. Bye, guys.